Kyle Murphy for suggesting the uh, the topic area for this and giving me the unenviable task of um, trying to make uh, metrics and validation interesting. Um, I guess a few uh, a few people have um, tuned in, so uh, hopefully hopefully folks are already interested. Uh, if not, my intent is to um, to run through this and not provide a tutorial necessarily, um, but to um, let me just grab a pointer here so that folks can see what I'm doing. Um, um, but to impress upon you uh, the importance of validation and, you know, so why should we do this? Um, uh, what can we obtain from it? And why is it important in everybody's workflow? Um, as well as, you know, maybe highlighting some pitfalls. Um, so what I wanted to start with was, you know, essentially my view of why validation is important and how metrics and uncertainty uh, come into that. Uh, so validation quantifies um, how well a model works. And by model, I'm going to say model a lot. I don't just mean, uh, you know, a, a physics simulation or an empirical model or a machine learning model or even a theoretical model. Uh, it's all of them. Uh, by model, I also mean data. Data also needs validation. Um, and a lot of the same techniques are used or in some cases have been developed on, say, on-orbit performance assessment. Um, validation also demonstrates that a model's adequate for any particular use case. Um, now, we often think about, you know, well, let's use this model and we think about that in the sense of, say, a transition to operations, uh, you know, but realistically, our research uses models all the time and we should be able to tell ourselves that yes this we have demonstrated and quantified that this model is adequate for our use case um, validation also helps us identify not just when and where predictions miss which is obviously very important but also can help us understand why predictions miss and then that can feed back into future research as well as defining where we should and shouldn't use our models so um, I wanted to, uh, to open up with this um, uh, R2 Ouroboros. And so this is um, the uh, two interlocking Ouroboroses, the Ouroboros being um, a, a serpent eating its own tail, representing a, a continuous life cycle. And so we have two here, one representing the, uh, the research cycle, one representing the operations cycle. Starting with the one on the left, uh, the, the concept here is that uh, the life cycle of a research idea can be tracked from its conception here. So where you, you, you have the idea, you innovate and you have an idea. You move that through to a proof of concept. You, you bring all of the building blocks together and you build out how you're doing your research. You show that you can attain some form of the things that you wanted to build. Um, and then you evaluate it. Does it do what it's supposed to? Um, you know, how good is it? Um, can it capture the phenomenology that you were intended uh, that you were intended it to use? Um, and if it does, that's great. You might want to build on it. If it doesn't capture everything you want, you might need new uh, new innovations to to enable it to do that. And so that's a continuous cycle that you keep moving through. And that's not complete without the evaluation. Uh, at every point, um, at every time around the cycle, you need to say, does this do what I intended it to do and how well? So then we can move to our other Ouroboros, which is the, um, the operational perspective. So uh, sometimes, and this is not at all a necessary transition, but sometimes uh, research output can move to operations and that's not really going to happen without an evaluation of it so that we know uh, how well it does what it's supposed to do and whether it has uh, potential use. So it'll follow this uh, research to operations pathway here from evaluation. 
it'll go through transition, which is a process, it's not a point, it's, it's a long process. Um, and that now operational product um, is in use, which leads to a whole bunch of data collection on how uh, it's able to perform relative to reality. And so that feeds back into further evaluation where you could get a correction that needs to be transitioned, um, or it may raise questions that really require a return to the research cycle to, to solve uh, things that are needed by the customer. And so then that's the operations to research pathway. Um, for the purposes of this talk, um, I wanted to say, obviously, you know, operations is a very important thing, um, but we can, uh, we can kind of uh, bring this a little closer to home and say that actually, uh, in a lot of cases, it's not going to be formal operations. Um, it's going to be downstream use by either fellow researchers, uh, future you as a fellow researcher, I'm constantly doing things for future me to make my life easier. Um, and if you, uh, I'm going to refer folks to the application usability uh, level framework that was in um, Alexa Halford's uh, paper of, of 2019, which uh, sort of shows this um, uh, process of um, developing research projects with a, with a user in mind. And it highlights the fact that that user could be you or your fellow scientists and not just um, you know, a space weather prediction center. Uh, so for formal transition, you know, formal evaluation tends to follow this VV and A process. So that's verification, validation, and accreditation. It's really big in um, engineering disciplines, government, uh, you know, military type applications, that sort of thing. VVNA is a huge deal. It's a subject unto itself that supports multiple research groups. So, what is VVNA? I'm going to do an explain like I'm five because uh, you know this this far into the pandemic, that's about all I can deal with. Um, so, three letters in it. The first B is verification. Did I build the thing right? Is the short way of of, of phrasing that. Uh, validation is, did I build the right thing? It's a similar question, but it has a very different approach and a very different outcome. And then accreditation, which is, is it believable enough to be used? Now, the accreditation part is not something that uh, we're really going to touch on here, um, but it is part of the process. And again, I've, I've you know stolen this friendly looking figure from, uh, from Alexa Halford's paper. Uh, because in the application usability level framework, um, what's highlighted there is the need to have a user in mind. And so when you're doing, for example, validation, this is validation for a particular use. And that use is going to determine what needs to be achieved in order for it to, to meet the standard. So there's no universal standard here. Okay. Um, so pushing accreditation to one side for now, we've got verification and validation. Verification, uh, a slightly more complicated way of, of framing that is, does my code correctly compute what it was intended to, uh, which is obviously super important. Uh, and that is, of course, covered by the software testing frameworks, unit testing, functional testing that everybody does with all of their software all of the time. So I'm going to sweep that to one side as well and move to validation, which is, does my code give a meaningful answer? And that's a much more ambiguous question than the verification question. Um, and so let's say we have a very complicated model, you know, on the on the right hand side here, we have a comparison of geomagnetic disturbance prediction errors from a selection of different models as a function of the driving parameters. Uh, some of these models were targeted to predicting one quantity. Some of these models are very complex models that predict a number of things. And this is just one output. And so the question is, are we validating a model? And I would say no. 
we're validating that prediction. So in this case, this was a, um, a magnitude of rate of change of the magnetic field. Okay, so what we're doing is validating that particular output, not the whole model space. Um, and that's because in this case, the intended model application was to provide this as a proxy for the hazard to the bulk power system. Um, so validations performed by comparison with data. Um, and so this is where I'm going to say, okay, comparison with data. Let's just do that. Let's just compare model to data. Right? That's, uh, that's a short sentence that's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Um, formal verification, validation, and accreditation doesn't necessarily make sense for small projects. Validation is still important. I think that's been emphasized by recent changes uh, to the, especially NASA and NSF uh, proposal calls. Um, you know, uh, building validation into, into the proposals themselves and essentially having it in the plan from the start, which I think is implied by the, uh, by the section that I just ran through and, you know, so the application usability framework, the R2 Ouroboros really highlights that, you know, it's coming up, you should probably plan for it. Okay. So. Some of the terminology that I want to clarify right up front, I'm going to be talking about metrics that was in the title. Um, a metric in this sense, um, you know, it's not your model output. Your model output is not the metric. Um, a metric is a quantity that describes an aspect of model performance. And so, you know, you could have a metric that describes the accuracy, like the root mean squared error. You could have a metric that describes the bias, like the mean error. Um, so those are your metrics. I'm going to talk about predict ends. Um, you know, statistical term uh, just means the quantity that is to be predicted. So that what we're aiming to predict is the predict end, and the input variables that we're using to get there are our predictors. Okay, so um, our predict end, if we're interested in uh, the hazard for satellite surface charging, we might be interested in an integral electron flux. Uh, now that's not our metric, that's our predict end, and, our, and we need to have a suite of metrics to understand how the model performs. Okay, um, so I said aspects of model performance, um, depending on which school of thought you follow, there can be a number of different, uh, well, there can be a different number of aspects of model performance. Um, I tend to look a lot towards the uh, weather forecasting literature. Um, you know, there's there's a wealth of information there, and in uh, the kind of prevailing descriptions in that literature, there are these nine um, aspects of model performance, which are uh, intrinsically related to one another, but each of them is different, even if there's even if they feed into each other, they, they, they're they all uh, looking at different things. So what our metrics are doing here is they're assigning values, quantitative values to the different aspects of model performance, okay? So the ones that I'm gonna uh, pay the most attention to are accuracy, association, bias, skill, and uncertainty. And these are fairly widely used. They're easy to apply to continuous predict ends, you know, if you have a number that can take any any given value, so like electron flux, DST index, that kind of thing, or categorical predictions, you know, uh, which a lot of solar flare forecasts are just yes, no, am I going to get a flare? That's a categorical prediction. Um, there's also this block in the middle. Uh, it's a, um, they're widely used, um, but not so much in space physics and they are generally assessed for categorical or probabilistic models. So uh, we might hint at some of them, but you know, they're there, there's literature about them. The other thing that I'm not going to talk about um, is the value of a prediction. And so this isn't a property of the model performance. Uh, the model performance obviously plays into it, but you don't necessarily need the most accurate model for it to provide value. And conversely, a very accurate model 
may not provide value for a, a given use case. Um, so there are additional tools that can be used. Um, I've highlighted this one from a, a paper of, of Matt Owens, um, uh, cost loss uh, analysis, which can help determine uh, under what circumstances a model might provide value. And in the case he had here, uh, he was showing that, you know, if you look for a case where false alarms are important to avoid, then, you know, both of his models provide value. Um, if you're looking uh, at, in a situation where missing events has a more significant operational impact, then neither of the models he looked at was particularly good, but only his ensemble model provided value over a climatological forecast. And so, you know, this is uh, ideally a conversation that would be had with, an, with, a, with a user, but it's also something that can be done absent of a specific user to give a, uh, a general idea of under what circumstances your forecast may have value. So metrics, I'm not going to talk through the table. Um, no one, no one needs that today. So, but what the table does show is it shows a range of, um, of metrics uh, for accuracy and bias. It also shows errors. Um, accuracy is what is the typical amount by which our model misses. And so this is typically an unsigned um, uh, quantity. So a mean squared error or a mean absolute error. And so it gets rid of the sign. You don't care which direction you missed by. It's just how much did you miss by. Um, and so that can be done either as an absolute value or as a relative error. Um, ideally, we would want to be able to interpret in the units of the predict end, which is why, for example, we use root mean squared error over mean squared error because the units are more interpretable. Um, bias tends to be a signed error, although frequency bias is, a, is an outlier for that one. Um, uh, it tends to be a signed error because what we want to know is, do we normally overestimate or underestimate? Which, which way do we lean? Okay. Um, skill uh, is an interesting one. It's, it's related to accuracy, but it's very much not accuracy. It's accuracy relative to another model. Um, prediction efficiency is widely used in space physics. It is just a skill score, um, but it's a the way that we use that phrase prediction efficiency is the skill score using the mean squared error as the accuracy metric and the climatological mean as the reference model. Um, so the, um, the, the equation down here in the bottom is a generic skill score formulation. Um, and so what we show uh, in these figures here, it's just a, a short interval of uh, the REFM predictions from you know, Space Weather Prediction Center, as well as providing this prediction for the community, for, for users. They provide performance data and they provide skill relative to three reference models. So they provide pre prediction efficiency. They also provide skill relative to 27 day recurrence, which is obviously common in space physics because of the solar rotation. Um, and persistence is also a widely used reference model. Persistence being the prediction that your next step is going to be the same value you currently have. So a persistence uh, temperature forecast would be tomorrow is going to be the same temperature as today. Um, and if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you probably don't like the sound of that right now. You're probably saying, you know what, I'd like it to cool off a little bit. Um, association was another one that I highlighted here. Um, and association is just a statistical relationship between variables. Um, we usually use correlation to describe this uh, without qualification. If we say correlation, that's usually Pearson correlation which assumes a linear relationship. There are a number of nonlinear association measures. Um, and so it's important to be careful in how we interpret measures of association because they're not measures of accuracy. There are a lot of um, potential pitfalls. Um, I will point out though that if we're comparing our 
uh, predicted, uh, our forecast predict end to our observed predict end, um, that's the same quantity. And so it's necessarily assuming that a, in, like a perfect forecast will have a linear model of y equals x. Now, does that mean that the association will actually have a linear relationship? No, it just should. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind that there are some caveats here. Okay, so um, having established that there are multiple um, aspects of forecast uh, of predictive performance that we can assess, um, I think it's probably no surprise that I'm going to tell you that that necessitates that we're going to have to use multiple metrics. Um, and I would suggest that one accuracy metric is not going to give you a full picture of the accuracy. Uh, it's going to give you a representation of the accuracy. But what you're doing with that metric is you're condensing an awful lot of data into one number. And so, you know, it's entirely reasonable that you're going to lose information by trying to summarize it and make it interpretable. So uh, at a minimum, you would want one metric for each performance aspect that makes sense. Um, ideally, you would probably want to use multiple so that you can actually um, kind of give a fuller view of how your model is performing in different ways. Um, and there's a lot out there. I mean, I've got this table here, um, but there's so many, so many more. Um, and needs for something new can arise. Uh, it's far more likely that there's already something out there that not only fits your VVNA needs, but also um, has known properties and interpretation. I think those properties and interpretations are very important to, to kind of understand and dig into. Um, probabilistic predictions. Uh, you can see my can of gummy worms here. Um, this is my way of saying that I'm largely going to avoid this as well because this is another this is another couple hours to skim the surface um but i will point out the probabilistic predictions can come in a variety of forms and they're really like it's, it's a real gross area in space physics you know there's conditional probability models models that natively predict distributions um i've shown the uh, the work here that uh, shibaji chakraborty did um predicting the kp index probabilistically using a deep Gaussian pro process. Um, there's ensemble modeling. Um, I'm largely going to avoid this just because it's such a big area. However, this is my sales pitch time. <clears throat> Do you need validated cut? Anyway, so the, um, the point being that there are open reproducible tools to help you with this as well. There's um, the MET software suite, uh, which you know, I'm mentioning because, uh, you know, if you have a large project, that might be a good fit for you. For a smaller research project, especially if you work in Python, um, you know, there's the PyForecast Tools uh, suite, which is validated and provides uh, a lot of um, tools for uh, model validation for continuous categorical probabilistic forecasts as well as some convenience plotting tools and if you need something that's not there there are issue trackers we take pull requests let's build our open source community tools together and make it useful to everyone um so what i'm going to do uh for a lot of uh the remainder is i'm going to uh predict dst using an oversimplified case study. And um, the main reason that I went for this is that it's easier to contrive an outcome. Um, you know, it's, it's great to review the, the good work that's in recent literature, but it's also a lot of work to put that together. Uh, so, so I have contrived a prediction and um, I'm picking DST uh, mostly because it's easy but partly because, well, you know, what, what could my motivation be for predicting DST? I could say, well, I want to be able to understand how the ring current evolves. Um, I want to use DST as an input to another uh, a model that I have, whether that's physics-based or empirical. Um, and so I'm just going to say that, you know, 
my, my make-believe use case here is DST is an input for another model. I care about the size of it and I'm probably more interested in storms. Okay, so for uh, consistency, we'll need a, an established grand truth data set. Let's use the Kyoto World Data Center's definitive uh, final DST. Um, I want a reproducible baseline reference forecast. I'm going to use climatology and of course we'll have to define exactly what I mean by that because if I say climatology, am I using all available DST data? Am I using just a particular training set? What are those dates? Um, and for validation, it's very important that your training data not contaminate that. So you want to do out of sample testing. Um, you, uh, some data sets are um, autocorrelated, so randomly sampling times isn't necessarily going to give you independent data. And I really want to highlight that if your model is physics based, it probably still uses parameterization somewhere. They don't all, but a lot of them do. You know, if you have uh, a couple physics model for the full magnetosphere, it probably has parameterizations when you couple to the ionospheric um, solver. You know, those parameterizations come from data. This counts as training data. So if you can at all avoid um, that interval for doing your validation, it is desirable. Okay, so I had the, uh, the luxury of deciding what I was going to do in advance of working on it this weekend. So, um, you know, I, my plan is here. I'm going to run the models in a predetermined configuration. My predict end is the DST index because that's what I decided I wanted. Um, and I'm gonna just start with some commonly used metrics. Um, so I'm going to look at association. I'm going to look at accuracy and I'm going to look at skill. You know, that's uh, a not uncommon combination. So what are my models? Um, I'm using two models here. Uh, model one, I made a neural network with two hidden layers, just so I could say I did deep learning. Um, so it doesn't have four neurons per layer, it has 30, four is easier to draw. Um, and I'm going to train that model with data from 1997 because uh, number one, I'm lazy. Number two, it was a fantastic year. Uh, I miss 1997 every day. Uh, the predictors for that model, I'm just using um, solar wind speed, uh, the north south component of the inter interplanetary magnetic field, and the current value of DST. And I'm using this to predict one step ahead, so DST at T plus one. Model two, I'm doing a one step ahead prediction with the O'Brien McFerrin version of the Burton equation. That's uh, the, the fuzzy equation in the bottom right here. This has a, a, a much smaller set of predictors and it was trained on uh, because they have fitted model coefficients that has training data. It was trained on data from 64 to 96. So, if we have 64 to 96 for the O'Brien model and our neural net was trained on 97, let's pick something that's not contaminated by that. I chose 2004. Um, now, this isn't necessarily the best uh, approach to doing DST modeling or to doing validation. Uh, I only have one year for my training set and one year for my test set. Um, my training set, 97 was solar minimum. Um, it was reasonably quiet. There were some high speed streams, not much in the way of CMEs. 2004, very active, lots of CMEs, not much in the way of high speed streams. Um, the training and test data should both cover the desired parameter space. So we want to cover multiple sizes of storms in both of these. We want to cover different phases of the solar cycle in both of them. And I very obviously haven't done that. Uh, but this is something that needs to be kept in mind. So we'll start by assessing the association. Top panel here is DST as a function of time. Uh, the bottom three panels are observed DST plotted against predicted DST for three different models. So on the right here, we have uh, my climatology prediction. We have the O'Brien model in the middle and the neural net on the left. Um, 
The only line that stands out as being noticeably different on the top plot is this horizontal line that is climatology, which I have done as the, cli the sample climatology of my training set, which I'm assuming is representative of all time. You can argue about how much you like that assumption. Um, obviously, there is no association between this climatological prediction and the actual observed value because I'm predicting the same number every time. Um, in terms of the sharpness of this uh, forecast, this is not a sharp uh, forecast. It has no ability to uh, predict different types of events. Okay. Um, and you can see here that we have uh, very high correlations for both of my other models, um, 0 0.985, 0 0.986. One thing I want to point out before I move on is that we're doing this as kind of an all at once assessment you can see that the DST is predominantly quiet. Uh, you can go, you know, look at distributions of this. I think, you know, uh, Jeff Love has a few papers, um, you know, and DST is typically small. And you can see that by this high density of points um, up here at, at the smaller DST values. Um, you can see we only cross my arbitrary threshold of 100, minus 100 nanotesla a few times. And 2004, like I said, was a very active year. So these active times are rare in the test data and the way we're doing this, our correlation is dominated by values at less active times. So essentially what it's doing in the tail is not well reflected in this value. Um, so we'll move to the accuracy, which does suffer a similar, um, uh, does suffer a similar drawback. Um, and we can see that there's the accuracy of, of the climatological prediction you know, we have a tip a root mean squared error of 26 nanotesla. Uh, you know, uh, is that is that good enough for your end for, for your end use? Probably not, but you never know. There are some cases where it might be. Um, and you can see that these other two predictions, uh, they look pretty good to me. Uh, the O'Brien one step ahead is a four and a half nanotesla root mean squared error. And so that's the best performing with this measure. If we look at the skill, it's no surprise then that the O'Brien model is still the best looking at the skill. Um, the prediction efficiency, which is what I'm using for skill here, is greater than 96% for both of them. Um, the Because it's relative accuracy and I'm using mean squared error, the highest accuracy also has the highest skill. Um, I would point out, I haven't really mentioned uncertainty yet, but I think this case here, as, as contrived, <laughs> um, highlights the fact that, well, are these numbers different? I mean, can we can we really say the O'Brien model is better here? Is, is that difference significant? And so uncertainty is not just a property of the particular model um, that we're uh, using, but there's also uncertainty involved in this number that comes out. Um, and, you know, there are obviously ways that I'm not going to get into that you can assign uncertainties to these and try to assess whether they're actually different. So let's switch the baseline model because climatology, it's a, you know, it's a good no skill forecast. Um, but we know that DST changes slowly. So let's try persistence, um, you know, Climatology may not be the right reference, and we might be um, giving ourselves a, uh, a rosier view of how we're performing than we need to. So we use persistence, um, which, as I said, is next step is same as current step. I have put the skill relative to climatological mean across the bottom here. Even our persistence model is exceeding 96% prediction efficiency. And the root mean squared error is under five nanotesla, same as the other two. So now if we assess the skill relative to persistence, we can see that you know there's a 10% improvement in accuracy from our neural net. There's a 17% improvement in accuracy from our one step ahead of O'Brien model. Um, now, our interpretation of how well these models are doing has probably changed subtly. 
So the point I wanted to make with this is that summary measures don't tell the full story. Any given summary measure is not going to give you the full story. A suite of them does better. Um, and it, but if doing an all at once um, validation only tells you how you do on average. And on average, DST is quiet, which means that none of this is telling us really how we did for the bits that we're likely interested in. Um, there's no information about how our predictions perform at different strengths of DST. Uh, you can see here that predict persistence performs well. By definition, it's an hour late with any changes. Is missing the onset of a storm by one hour important? If it's not, well, honestly, we don't need a DST one step ahead model. Uh, if it is important, persistence it's not a great prediction, even though the accuracy is good. Um, the O'Brien McFerrin model doesn't lag the data as much. The neural net, I haven't assessed this. It seems to be somewhere in between. Um, so there are questions like, you know, how does our performance change with DST? And I've, I've added some lines and arrows to guide the eye on here. Um, so you can see that for the case of our neural net, at these, uh, at these, for these stronger storms, uh, the neural net uh, appears to tend to under predict. Now that could be a function of our terrible choice in training data set. Um, you, could, you could also maybe convince yourself that the uh, prediction is less certain at, um, for stronger storms than it is for weaker storms. Now, this is just my interpretation of a scatter plot. Uh, the ideal thing to do would be to quantify that. Uh, we'd also ideally want to attach uncertainties to each of these predictions. And so we can use um, Gaussian assumptions to get a prediction interval. We can use resampling methods to get a prediction interval. We can fit a model to the residuals to estimate the width of our probability distribution. Um, so there are a number of different things we can do to get to an uncertainty here. Um, but looking at how do we do as a function of uh, driver strengths or as a function of event strengths, um, I point folks to the work that's kind of growing out of the Coast Bar International Space Weather Action Teams. Um, I'm just focusing on uh, geomagnetic index prediction and there's a good write up of the, the early work from that group um, in a paper led by Michael Moan in 2018. Um, there are obviously papers for other, uh, other topic areas and there's ongoing work. Um, but what this shows is the SIMH prediction for um, the RAM SCB in a magnetosphere model. And it's, this is one of the methods of looking at how your um, prediction varies as a function of the value that you're predicting. Okay, so the way that it was done here is by turning that continuous prediction into a categorical prediction. So essentially it defines a threshold value, which is plotted across the bottom here and says, if you're above that, it's a no. If you're below that, it's a yes. That gives you two categories of, of event, yes events and no events. And you can then use a number of binary event uh, metrics like Heidke skill score, which is a, a true skill, uh, like it's a, it's a it's an actual skill metric. Okay, so this is relative to a random baseline. Probability of detection and probability of false detection are what they sound like. False alarm ratio is probably not what it sounds like, but I'll let you go look that one up. Frequency bias is um, the essentially the number of, are you getting the right number of events? Above one is too many. You're predicting too many storms in this case. Uh, and below one is that you are under predicting the number of storms. And so you can see here, you know, this is skilled across a, a reasonable range. Uh, you might be curious about why it seems to be unskilled at uh, positive DST. Well, RAM SCB is an inner magnetosphere model. It doesn't have a magnetopause, so it can't get those magnetopause current driven positive excursions. It's just not in the model. Um, so there are a number of things that you can learn from doing this. Um, 
there's also things that you can do in terms of statistical post-processing to improve your predictions. Just because you have a model and it's not the best doesn't mean that you have to stick with that. Um, you can go back and feed into and, and feed back into improving your model. In the interim, you can do statistical post-processing to improve the usefulness of your model outputs. Um, and so model output statistics, again, is, is very popular in um, uh, weather forecasting literature. Um, it's an objective technique, uh, generally uses your model forecast, prior observations, climatological data. Um, National Weather Service uses multiple linear regression uh, with, some, with some bells and whistles. There's a number of different ways you can do this. Um, so stealing this from their, um, from their web page, um, they obviously have lists of limitations, et cetera, as well. I've highlighted the two that I want to note here. Um, this actually lets you correct systematic model biases and largely conditional biases. But it also um, lets you quantify uncertainty depending on how you do this model output statistics. Um, so I'm going to look at the conditional bias for our DST predictions. And I'm going to uh, do this by fitting a robust linear model um, to our prediction observation uh, data, right? Um, and so I do that, I get a slope that's close to one, I get an offset that's close to one uh, nanotesla. Um, and then for each neural network prediction, I can use my linear model to actually correct the prediction. Okay, uh, this is usually done with far more complicated forms. It's often used to co correct conditional biases in physics-based models. So, you know, if you have a physics-based model that's known to underpredict in some cases, you know, use, use something like this to, to get to an uncertainty and to correct your conditional biases. So when I do that, what changed? Um, I mean, so we have the two left-hand plots here are for um, the neural net in the middle and the neural net corrected by our model output statistics on the left. Um, the correlations basically unchanged, we would expect that to happen. It's an association. We've just essentially reordered things along a line. Um, that's not going to change the association. Um, it does change the accuracy. It, it reduces the root mean squared error, which makes it more accurate. And how has it done this? It's done this by reducing the bias. So essentially, it has pulled uh, you because you can see that this is not um, this was not a, a straight line along y equals x. So it's pulled that whole thing closer to the line. So it's reduced the conditional bias. Um, now, I will also note that the bias, which we didn't look at earlier, is actually still smaller for that one step ahead O'Brien model. So while our model output statistics corrected neural net has a higher skill now, um, it still also has a higher bias. Now, is that important? depends on what you want to use it for. Um, our linear correction isn't actually fully accounting with, for the conditional bias. It only accounts for a very small part of it. And you can see that by the fact that we have this, um, this region over here on the left where uh, we're still underestimating, even after I've attempted to correct the conditional biases. You'll note that the O'Brien model doesn't have that. And if we were to go through the type of exercise that's in the uh, community best practices put forward in the Lamone paper, we'd be able to quantify this and show exactly where this becomes a problem and how much of a problem it is. So our model output statistics should probably be done in a more sophisticated way. Um, and so all that to say that regardless of the lower root mean squared error and the higher skill, if we're interested in stronger storms, we should really actually assess that part of parameter space because the one step ahead of Brian McFerrin model is likely better for our intended use. And so just looking at the RMSE here is really misleading if we're interested in predicting those stronger storms. Um, we can also um, use model output statistics for uncertainty. I'm not going to really run through this, but I do want to draw your attention to not just the uh, the statement that we can do it, but also the, uh, the, the 
novel approach to doing it that uh, Enrico Camporiali led um, a couple of years ago. Um, and he didn't call it model output statistics, but essentially it's, um, he used a neural net to estimate the probability distribution centered on a prediction using the predictors of the original model, a set of the residuals. It's a model output statistics approach. Um, and so it gives a nice way of illustrating that you can get a probabilistic prediction from a non-probabilistic model um, and one of the advantages to, uh, to, to their approach was that it specifically took into account um, the, uh, the sharpness and the calibration. So it gives a calibrated outcome, um, which, is, which is actually uh, a really nice thing to have intrinsically come out of the method rather than having to do calibration post hoc. And so uncertainty, like, um, there's a lot of stuff you can get out of uncertainty. Obviously, uh, you know, it's really nice to say if we just look at the top panel here, we have an observation as well as a uh, in red as well as a model prediction in in blue. It kind of doesn't matter what this is, but it's written on the side anyway. You can see here that they often don't seem to agree. Now, do we expect that? Do we not expect that? Is this good? Is this bad? Um, I mean, I don't know why this missed and I can't tell you whether it's good. So in this case, we assess the uncertainty um, in the output that was due to an uncertain driver, you know, well, insufficient specification of the driver. And so we did this as an ensemble model. You can see the middle panel now has a representation of 40 different runs of our simulation to give kind of a, a, an estimate of spread. You can turn that through ensemble dressing into an uncertainty distribution. Um, and what this then gets us to is you can see here that actually most of this, like you'd look at this and say, well, this obviously missed, except that it's mostly within the probability distribution. Some activities clearly not resolved. So for example, we have this long enhancement here that's not picked up by the model and the model's pretty confident. Uh, we've also dramatically missed this point. And we can use our uncertainty not only to say, actually, the model is doing well, it's our boundary condition that's not well specified, but we can also then go back and say, what's not being captured adequately in our model? And this is a strong partial ring current that wasn't building up in the simulation. This was the substorm that led to the failure of the Galaxy 15 telecommunications satellite. And this particular model is known, well, this particular class of models is known to have some issues fully representing substorms. So this really highlights uh, exactly where and by and to what degree that happens. Okay, so, so uncertainty um, is a really powerful tool. And I wanna finish with the same slide I start, started with and just say that I think, Hopefully I've communicated the importance of validation and the fact that it should be built into the workflow and life cycle of every research project, whether it's intended for operations or not. Um, it quantifies how well your model works. It quantifies where it works. It, it can help you if, you if you push into the uncertainty, it can help you understand why it works or doesn't. Um, and this isn't just applicable to the neural net that I showed or the uh, theoretical uh, model with uh, empirical coefficients from that one step ahead um, uh, O'Brien McFerrin formulation. Um, it can be applied to data. I, I didn't show any on orbit assessment just because it takes a little longer to, uh, to um, get a talk on that through our, through our system. but. Um, it also demonstrates if you do want to hand your work off to other people, and I think as scientists, we all do, uh, it demonstrates that your model is adequate for any particular use case and presenting more information on how well things work and where is valuable information for anyone who's downstream interested in your work. Um, and identifying when and where those predictions miss, identifying model failings, it doesn't reflect on the person doing the work. 
it opens pathways to future research. It's a good thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think uh, hopefully, hopefully you're all on board and uh, we'll see a, a, a growth in, in validation work. Um, and I'm gonna leave it there and uh, kick it back over to the hosts. So thank you all for still being here. All right, thank you very much, Steve. That was quite an interesting and engaging presentation. I, I really appreciated the sort of tutorial flavor of it as well, since that's that's perfect for these types of uh, seminar series uh, that we that we host, so that people can go back and and review a lot of the details. Uh, so yeah, so at this point, um, a couple of people are putting their kind of praise hands and claps, saying great presentation, and we'll let people uh, send any questions in the chat. In the meantime, I actually have a couple of questions I get to ask first. Uh, back to that can of worms slide with the gummy worms with about probabilistic predictions. I was kind of curious, it's um, some of the validation techniques here are still new to me and I'm, I'm very curious about how to implement them in my own studies. Uh, so how would you say, for instance, like the 2019 uh, Camporiali and Rico uh, paper there, would, it, was that sort of an example of these you know, difficult probabilistic predictions? I think you had mentioned it was not a probabilistic model, but it wound up producing a probabilistic prediction. So yeah. how would you approach the metrics and validation for that? So um, that's a that's a great question, and so the um, so the the I guess the the way that that differs from uh, what I was focusing on is that you know instead of having a single value that you get to compare at any given time, you have um, a uh, you have obviously a, a probability distribution now. And actually, let me flick forwards if I can. So um, where is this? Do I have it? Yeah. So um, uh, spare slides are always useful, right? Um, so in the in the work that I was kind of showing at the end there, so this is from a paper of mine uh, with um, uh, Dan Welling and Jesse Woodruff in, in 2018. Um, so we built a probabilistic um, model from an ensemble. Um, and so there's a number of things you can do. So for example, you get this probability distribution, which I've shown here with like a 95% confidence band and a 50% confidence band. So what you get out of this is you get a distribution, right? So you can then, for example, turn it into a categorical threshold, a uh, categorical prediction, right? You can say, okay, now I have a probability, so I can do that. And you can vary the, um, you can vary sort of the, uh, the probability at which you said you got an event. Um, you can, um, so there's, there's a lot of tools uh, that you can look at. And obviously the Camporiale paper actually kind of goes into a little bit of it, you know, because they use some of that in fitting their probabilistic output to make sure it is well calibrated. Um, so there's um, uh, continuous rank probability scores. Um, there's uh, Briar scores are a good way of looking at um, uh, essentially it's a root mean squared error for probability of an event occurrence. Um, you know, if you start looking at um, uh, true positive rates and false positive rates uh, as a function of your, um, your probability threshold for the prediction that gets you into, um, into rock curves um, and then reliability diagrams, which help you assess whether you're calibrated, uh, whether you're skillful. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different approaches and there's an awful lot of literature there. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. that's why I put the can of worms there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Thanks for kind of addressing that. It's definitely you know, very helpful to think about. And that's actually a good segue. You mentioned some work by Dan Welling and in that collaboration there, he's actually going to be giving our seminar next week for those who of course are going to be uh, tuning in for that. He'll be talking about uh, end to end modeling and space weather applications. So I'll be sure and, to see that for next week. And I believe that also there's an upcoming talk by Jordan Guerra, uh, which is going to hit some of the ensemble modeling as well. Yes, that's right. Which is that. also going to answer some of those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. No, very, uh, very interesting for sure. Um, so yeah, with that too, I don't see uh, any other questions here. I know I happen to know Steve, you had said you're right in the middle of a summer school there too. So we don't want to keep you uh, too long in, in the midst of that. But um, I also mentioned, I think you had said something about cheers to 1997, right? We could, if we could go back to some of those events, that'd be, uh, that'd be kind of fun to, to see that as well. But um, 
So yeah, but in any case, thanks very much again for giving the seminar this week. And I uh, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Well, uh, thank you everybody again to organizers and attendees. It was a pleasure. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good week.